All right, I'd like to call to order, please, the uh, October meeting of the Bennington School District Board of Directors, please. Uh, the first item on the agenda is public comments. So does anyone have public comments? Lori Mulher, if you would please, please. Okay. So if you if you wouldn't mind to the mic, please. And uh, as per the policy we outlined last time, although most of us know your face, if you wouldn't mind telling us uh, who you are, what town you live in, and if you're representing any group, please. Lori Mulhern, resident of Bennington, parent of two students um, that live in Bennington. Uh, I wanted to approach the board about a couple of different things, one of them being um, uh, some documents that I'm ha still having trouble accessing, and that was in regard to the, to the facility meeting minutes. They're not in there, and the documents that they've been discussing, the Goldstone reports, I know that two of them were, but I haven't seen the others. And I was just wondering if they were available to be reviewed. Um, and that was one of my questions. Another question is, I do have um, some comments and questions about Act 46, but I didn't know if you wanted me to do them now or wait till you get to that agenda. So I, I do not envision the Act 46 committee update being a question and answer session. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can certainly answer, ask the questions now, Lori, but um, as you know, yeah. you, the design of this part of the meeting isn't for a question and answer either. If you want to put right. them out there, certainly um, feel free. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've been reviewing the documents for some time and have been reviewing the final documents that are going out there to the public. One of the questions that I have is that it's not really clear as to the public's participation in the budget process. Because before, the you know, every uh, district was able to, their residents were able to vote on their budgets, and now it looks like it would function similarly to the SVSU budget that is not voted on. And I'm just not clear about that, and there's no real clear information in any of the FAQs or in the proposal itself. Um, and as well as on that, I noticed that, you know, there was, oh, sorry about that. There's a lot of um, goals, but I don't see a whole lot of goals referring to community engagement or increasing communication between the families or the educational partnership. I see a lot of business-related goals, but I don't see that piece too. And a lot of these goals are set on, it will do this, but it doesn't say how. It doesn't identify the measurement tools that will be used to assess our progress. And I was wondering if anyone has developed anything that we could look at so that we have a better perspective on how this is going to work, because I think that that would be really helpful. And um, finally- Lori, I'm sorry, just as a point of information, are you referring to the, the articles of agreement? When, when you're talking about what you're reading- Goals one, two, three, four, and five- in, in the articles, in the okay, article thank itself. you. Yep. Right. Um, and the last thing being that, um, I, I, I know this is a biggie for, for me, not for everybody else, but a lot of the goals were set about <coughs> students in general, but I, you know, one of the challenges we've always had is service provision here for special education. We, we lack providers. And really I'm hoping that, you know, I'm a little disappointed that there's not anything related to, you know, improving outcomes in regards to the special education IEPs and 504s, even though it says something generalized about student performance. It's really not the same, and service provision is a biggie for us. And I'm hoping that um, somewhere down the pike, somebody will put a goal in there that says something about that. Thank you. Anyone else for public comments, please? I am Jenny Jenkins. I'm a resident of Bennington. I have notes to keep me on target. Um, I'm here because over the past six months I've spent more time trying to understand the Title I provisions in the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, than I ever imagined I would. Um, and the reason that I've done that is because I work in the Seedlings Program, which is in both Molly Stark and uh, Ben L. So Title I governs the federal funds that flow uh, to the states and are allocated to high poverty schools to provide supplemental academic support. <coughs> what I've learned is that due to the very high rates of child poverty in our SU, that over the last 10 years, the SVSU and the Burlington School District have received more Title I funds than any other school systems in Vermont. Um, and we're not talking about small amounts of money. Um, we've received, over the past three years, 
Each year we've received a little bit more than $2 million uh, in, in funding. So that in the last three years, we have over $6 million that has been allocated to help level the academic playing fields for kids in poverty. I understand the money can be used for a variety of things, everything from hiring reading specialists to trainings to direct service uh, to children. This is really important because in addition to being a high poverty area, we also have significant academic challenges. The reason I wanted to speak to this board is because there are very strong correlations to success in reading by in third grade and high school graduation rates uh, and performance in high school. A number, a number of studies have come out. Uh, most recently, there's a 2017 study by the Annie E. Casey Foundation called Early Warning! Exclamation point, why reading by the end of third grade matters. <coughs> there are other studies that have come out. Uh, it looks like over the last 10 years, this has been something that's been uh, explored quite, um, uh, quite regularly. And uh, there are links between third grade reading <coughs> achievement uh, that show that students that are not reading on three, third grade level uh, at third grade are four to 13 times more likely to either not graduate high school on time or to not graduate high school at all. And that where you fall in that four to 13 range depends on poverty. Okay, so the, the, higher, the higher levels of poverty, the, the stronger the chances are you are not gonna graduate uh, from high school. As I'm sure you are all aware, the latest data that's available, the 2015-16 data for, uh, for BSD, indicates that the overall percent of BSD students in third grade that are not working, that are working on grade level, is 39%. To break that down, only 22% of third graders at Vanell are reading at grade level, only 38% of third graders at Mali are reading at grade level, and only 58% of kids at Monument are reading at grade level when they're in third grade. Not surprisingly, this tracks very closely to poverty rates in our, um, in our school systems, so that 87% of students at Benel are eligible for free and reduced lunch, 78% at Mali are, are eligible, and 50% of the students at Monument are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So obviously, in addition to concerns about academic achievement later in high school and post-secondary um, post attainment, one also has to look at self-esteem, interest in school, and the likelihood of building strong, positive community relationships in kids that are not meeting, um, are not academically meeting, uh, meeting uh, uh, academic levels. Therefore, it really does seem that, it, that we should have a strong focus on improving outcomes in our elementary schools. I am coming to you with four, four requests. Um, one, uh, I would request that we have a public presentation from the superintendent's office that explains in detail how Title I funds are spent in this SU. Second, that uh, please make the needs assessment plan for the SU available to the public. It is a public document. Three, um, provide a list of the research-based practices that the supervisory union plans to use to determine the effectiveness of its strategies. And lastly, to please explain the SVSU's plan to include the public which is required by Title I in both determining how the funds should be used and in examining the effectiveness of the strategies. What we do to educate our kids has lifelong impact on them. And it also has a lifelong impact on our community and our economic development. We have a real opportunity here to make sure that we're doing the very best work that we can do. And, you know, we may be doing that. But I think until we really, until the public has the opportunity to know how, what we're doing, how we're doing it, and why we're doing it, we, we can't know that for sure. So thank you very much for letting me speak to you. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. <coughs> Sean Marie, I think you're up. Hi. And, I'm sorry, Sean Marie, anyone else who also wants to do, uh, offer something for public comments? Yes, I do. 
Thank you. Hi, I'm Sean Marie Oler, and I live in uh, the town of Bennington. And I, Chris, was wondering if when you get to executive session, I see that you very um, diligently put that it's um, VSA 313A 3 and 4. But I'm wondering if, um, according to 313, that uh, when you make a motion to go into executive session, you are going to indicate the nature of the business of the executive session and um, that obviously you know the rules that no other matter can be considered. So 3A3 is the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee provided the public body shall not make a final decision to hire or appoint, da da da, and number four is a disciplinary, disciplinary or dismissal action against a public officer or employee, but nothing in this subsection shall be construed to impair the right of such officer. So I'm wondering when you go into executive session if you are going to state the nature of the executive session. Uh, again, because this doesn't offer, uh, this does not offer the platform for question and answer, I okay. won't answer that, but I would say that uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other question, um, which you may or may not answer, is it is October 2017, and I'm wondering when the audit for FY17, which was end of June 30th, will be coming to this board. It usually comes in October, reviewed in September. So maybe under chair's report or superintendent's report, since this is not a back and forth, you might mention when the audit will be ready for the public. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Mike Bethel. Uh, I just want to a question first. Are you going to have public comment? Are you going to talk about Act 46? Or are you just going to have a presentation by the Act 46 chair? So the presentation will be given as per the agenda, but it, I don't envision it being a question and answer session. Okay, so I can make my comments now about Act 46. Please. I hope people vote, whoops, excuse me, I forgot. I hope people vote no for Act 46 because they, this committee did not do its due diligence. It didn't study the alternative structure. It just went for one thing that that individual, Mr. French, that they hired, uh, brought forward. And they never discussed how much Bennington is going to be paying for all of the outlying districts' costs. Right now, we pay 68% of MAU's costs, but we use 68% of MAU's property, buildings, facilities. We send that many students there. We don't send 63% students to Shaftesbury, Powell, uh, Woodford and or North Bennington if they're a part of it. And my concern is for the taxpayers of Bennington, after a couple of years when the incentives supposedly are there and go away, we have no idea what the tax base is going to be in Bennington. None. And then the whole thing about closing schools after five years, they can move students around, sixth graders from the outlying districts. It just is rushed through. And the scare tactics being used by the chair and others that the state is going to force us to do this, force us. The state isn't going to force us to do anything. The state will come down here if we don't do it, look over what we've got. And if we've done 85% of what they've mandated for Act 46, and Donna Russo Savage told me this herself, okay, after two meetings, she told me it, um, they would probably leave us the way we are because we've already done that under Rick Pembroke, Bob Marco, Sean Marie, and Jackie Pru, and all the people that have been here before, they did a very good job with the financials. So I want people to know, in my opinion anyway, that they should vote no for this thing because it's going to squirrel us all up, and all the things that Lori talked about and everybody else, it's going to, it's just, it's, we've made great, great advances and we're not going to do anything with Act 46. And uh, there will be things in the paper, I've got things coming out that hopefully people will vote no on it. So thank you. Thank you. All right, very good. So moving on to item number two, which is finances and facilities. Uh, there was a treasurer's report for August uh, that was circulated in the board packet. Uh, any questions or comments on the treasurer's report as it was published? 
Um, well, it, is this where is this where we ask uh, when the audit will take place? I think that'd be a fine question, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Do you want? <laughs> well, let's, let's first. Motion that we accept the treasurer's report as yeah. in the packet. Okay. So any discuss? So the motion on the floor is to accept that report. Um, we'll hold Dr. Kelly's question off as a separate matter. But is there a second for the motion to second. accept the report? Thank you, Chayla. Any discussion on accepting the treasurer's report as published? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. So the motion carries. Um, but Jim, can you address Dr. Kelly's report, please? Okay. Question rather? I'm going to defer to Renee. The auditors are coming next week, but she can give you the timeline for that. Yeah. Um, so the schedule that we got on last year, um, their visit to us to do the bulk of their work ended up being in October. Um, they actually didn't complete their report in well into the following year. I don't think we actually got the, our final audits until March, if not April, of last year. We, of course, will certainly try to move them along. Um, but yes, they will be here the week of October 16th to do the bulk of their work. And then, you know, it, it's up to them and, and their workload as to how quickly they can turn. We certainly all those anticipate accounts. it's going to take a few months after they're on site before we have it. Right. Can I ask a follow-up question? Please. Uh, wh when did uh, when did uh, they present the last audit? What month? Varied by board. I, I have to go back. And look. I mean, I mean, I was, we were in budget season. I know we were doing that. I feel like we were wrapped up with right. Well, at, at, still the, at the CDC, the they they presented it in in uh, March. <clears throat> so, uh, to my knowledge, I, I've never seen it in in uh, to answer Sean Marie's. For here either, and in, in, in it, it was March and April that I've, I've had the audit present. The audit was presented in March and April. Uh, maybe it's o October that it's done, and April that it's presented. Jackie Pruitt. We used to get the audit, like Sean Marie said earlier. We used to get it um, like December when we had a different company. Now that we went to this new company, we didn't get it until March last year, mm -hmm. Renee. Yeah, it was yeah, later than what they had seen in Bonnie. So the previous company, I believe, came end of August, early September. Yes. That's when they would do, they'd do their on-site audit and then take a few months to get back to us. But uh, this company, which we're in our second year, oh, third, okay. year with, third year with, um, yeah. October 16th, they'll be on site. I mean, the, the, the good thing about having them come at this point in the year, though, is it allows us to do all of our posting back. So even well into July, August, and into September, we still have invoices coming in for the previous fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, so all that needs to get pushed back. So if they had come and done their preliminary work, we're, they're going to end up changing it all because of all the information that we're getting you know, subsequent to their visit. So that's the only benefit in them coming later is that we have everything completely shut down, closed up, and they can just take it and run with it. So. And, and a, a, a third question. Um, does, does the report, because I, I, I don't remember doing it, does the report uh, tell you what Title I funds, how the Title I funds were spent? Because, um, yeah, it's in there because it's a major fund that is included. So we won't have that question uh, for sure, Marie. It's in the, it would be in the SVSU um, oh. audit. Oh, it's not in the BSD audit. No, yeah, because it, it's uh, all of our grant, all of our federal monies are, are kept at the SU level. Chris. Yes, Jackie. Thank you. Um, Jeannie, but Jean Jenkins had a good point. We really should see, have a presentation by whoever does it, um, how the money is spent, what we're doing, how we're getting there, and what the results are, um, so that when we go into budget season, which we should be starting right now, <laughs> that they, um, we address the issues that need to be addressed. And, uh, and we have been asking for this kind right. of stuff anyway. Uh, and I don't know whether this is the time to ask it or if you have an other uh, at the end, but um, I'd like to make a motion based upon the present, well, the questions that were asked today, um, especially uh, on the test scores and 
and the sp spending of money uh, for special special students that that we form some kind of a committee that incorporates board members and uh, uh, people at large from the community and teachers and principals uh, so that we can look at test scores uh, all together and and uh, find remedies uh, and look at the monies that's spent on each of the various uh, components that we have and thinking about shifting or you know and this is all pre-budget it would mm -hmm. be a, a pre-budget uh, discussion so in terms of in terms of what you're suggesting so can you no, can you restate well let's let's restate the motion then because okay. I'm not please yes. yeah sure if it's, uh, if I'd it's like to make an agenda idea. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. In, in yeah. terms of budget, so uh, in terms of since this still falls under the budget the, finance, the, the idea of, of finance and facilities, um, mm -hmm. I, I think it makes complete sense for um, for us to have a, a presentation at some point based on what monies are coming in. I think that makes sense. I do know that there's an October twenty fifth. I think uh, twenty October twenty fourth workshop for board members and mm -hmm. the public at large. Uh, to talk more about um, about fi school finances, and I believe uh, the superintendent will speak a little bit about that uh, during a superintendent's report. Um, what we began last month and has worked out, I think, for this month in terms of people wanting to forward me agenda items, but certainly that makes a lot of sense to put on the agenda uh, at, at a point down the line. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's va there's value to everything that's been said. We just need to make sure we're doing it in the, in right, the proper way. Right, but it doesn't form a subcommittee, and and I think that's that's what the questions were tonight. So in, yep. So in terms of that, because uh, we will be having sort of a, a two month a two part presentation on on the latest test scores, what that means, and what the plan is. So let's put that on the agenda for next meeting because we will at the next uh, at the November board meeting hear from the building principals to speak about what the test scores for individual buildings and then we can add a, a larger discussion which may include a uh, building committee around that. Do you feel that that would yes, answer what you. you're concerned for? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, anything else related to finance or facilities? With the understanding we're going to have a facilities committee report down the line a bit? Okay, great. So moving on to the consent agenda. Um, a question before uh, I would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. Uh, I noticed that on the nomination for Mr. Davis, it spoke about the criminal record check not getting, not yet being completed. And I'm just wondering what's what's the process for completing the record check, and what's the general <coughs> time, please? It depends on the time of year. So we get an immediate response back on the background check from Vermont, but the uh, fingerprint check can take anywhere from three weeks to six weeks depending mm -hmm. on the time of year um, and we have no way of pushing that further mm -hmm. so, so. is it fair to say that a, that a vermont criminal record check has been done for yes Davis? yeah that's yeah. that's yeah. an immediate right because uh, that's computer check so we mm -hmm. get that but within minutes okay. back. all right so could i have a motion to approve the consent agenda please motion thank you Jayla. can i have a second please Second. Thank you, Dan. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Yes. Um, when I uh, read over the uh, um, the background for the person who's being hired, mm -hmm. um, it, it said one in one part that they had an associate's degree, and then in the in the end, it said that they had a bachelor's. So which is right? I believe the superintendent's consulting his records. And while you're consulting, can I ask a question? Sure. Well? While we're waiting five to six, three to six weeks for the federal background check to come through, the employee is not officially hired during that period, right? They're they are hired, but it's contingent on that. Which, in other words, if it comes back, are they back, in the building? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're with students. It, and it also didn't state what what types of certification they had. And because this is for an intensive special needs, pro which is a position. support staff, a para educator. Oh, it's a para. Oh, yes, yes, it's a para. para. It's a para oh, yeah. My yeah. I'll withdraw my question. Okay. 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 Yeah, you'll see that with the. Yeah. You can tell by I didn't see at the para. I saw level. teacher. Yeah. 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 So the sorry. The way it's <laughs> put up there. It's sorry. Is in one point. So in terms of an answer between associates and, and bachelors. So as associate, I'm looking yeah. at it saying that it has an the person has an associates. Mm -hmm. But then just, just above FTE, 
uh, full you know full time equivalency. It, it does no bachelor's, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe we can get we can get a clarification on that for you, Jackie, yeah. and, and let you know. Yeah, under under that it says that, but quite an extensive background. Yeah, it wouldn't make any difference in the Is pay classification room? for the parent. <laughs> Okay, very good. So um, there's a motion on the floor. Any further discussion about the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none. Uh, can I have a, all in favor of approving the consent agenda as published? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Beautiful, passes. All right, on to agenda item four, educational matters. I'll turn it over to Principal Dunn. <coughs> Hello. Hello. So I think back in August I said, you know, one of our goals was um, there would be a waiting list for the students at Ben L. What I can tell you in, in updating the enrollment report for this since August, uh, Ben L. is up to close to 290. We've got 289 as of today. 25 new students have come in to our building since um, our August enrollment. and. Um, that, that's had a, an interesting impact on classrooms and, and furniture and lots of things, as you would imagine. So we are attractive, and we've got 25 new students. So I think that's, I think our third grade totals are um, 24 average in a classroom. Fourth grade is about 24 average in a classroom. So we're starting to... Um, get up there in, in numbers. I'm not sure what it's been in, in years past, but we're keeping an eye on that. Um, I'd like to report that Open House was very successful September 20th. About 70% of families um, were in attendance. Um, that was really good to see. It was one of my first opportunities to mix with the entire school community. Um, we've also had one PTO meeting that was very well attended. And I've committed to those folks to um, set up a principal coffee at least monthly so that when parents drop off uh, students in the morning, um, we can mix and chat and they can have a open time to talk with me and just see how well that goes because it's very difficult um, to connect with a lot of parents in this, in this community. So mornings and then at dismissal tend to be the best times. And then again, when we have um, school functions, they really do come out for their kids. Uh, Nikki Forrest reports that we have again received the $1,000 Momentum Grant from Cliff, which is used to um, purchase books for, for students, and it's usually combined with a student and family event. We'll keep you posted on that. Um, assessment, as you'll hear from, from me and the other school principals, is in full swing. Um, this entire month has been, or. September through October has been dedicated to um, FastBridge, NIWA, MAPS testing, writing. So students may be coming home and telling you a lot about that. It does take a lot of work, but we need those that data to start progress monitoring throughout the year. I can also report that teacher collaboration teams are in, in full swing. We really have achieved through um, a lot of work in planning to have special educators, classroom teachers, interventionists all working together at the same time and having time to plan together. That's a major um, move forward in terms of what we're going to want to do in reporting out to you about student progress. Um, I can also report, because I've been spending a lot of time in classrooms and in the lunchroom and throughout the building. Uh, the positive expectations, this is a PBIS school, and I have to say from my past experience with PBIS schools, this is a super school in terms of how the implementation is going. Uh, it is a positive reward. Each teacher and um, team has implemented this, and I see it all day long, so I can report that to you. The PBIS team did meet uh, today, and they're planning on um, how to increase uh, classroom teacher participation on that team because that's really an important part of what we need to do. Uh, in terms of PR, I think I heard that from some of our folks um, in the community here tonight. One of our goals is to increase our communication and public relations with the community. Jerry O'Connor, my assistant principal, is working on um, 
Facebook page and um, we're also working on a web-based, our website calendar is just, everything needs updating on that website. So I'm working with uh, staff at central office who have a lot of control over that to work with me so that we can post for families what is happening in the school not not just the assessment calendar but events that they can see and they they have asked for that I can see that we have a lot of work to do um, there I would also like to um, remind folks you're going to be hearing a lot about um, mathematics instruction and curriculum this year. It's a focus for SU, for the SU and for our school in particular. We will be working in both professional development and with our math coach that's um, Pat Conway in the SU. And we've, we've identified critical areas within um, the grade levels where we really need to pay attention. And I thought that I might share with you just because this is an opportunity <coughs> to um, to actually do a little work about what are we doing with instruction. So in spending time in classrooms, in math classrooms in particular, I've identified what I will be looking for in those classrooms relative to um, excellent math instruction. So you know, I can give folks copies of this if you'd like it after, but I think it's really important that um, I can see and teachers know that there is um, a clear focus on math standards and they'll identify those standards for students. I'm going to particularly be looking for students engaged in learning. That's a real key piece. If, if um, student engagement, questioning strategies. I'm going to be looking for deep and focused teacher questioning, scaffolded and extending students' learning. I'm going to be looking for communication about math ideas. I'm going to be looking for posing and solving problems as an integral part of math instruction. I'm going to be looking for a focus on building understanding around math, math concepts. I'm going to be looking for varied representations of math thinking, not just the algorithm. And I'm going to be looking for ongoing informal assessment as an integral part of that instruction. So teachers will and have been receiving this indicator of um, what a good math instruction um, looks like in a classroom. So I thought I might share that with you so that you could get sort of an inside peek at, at, the, at the work that we do. Um, I think also that, oh, I wanted to celebrate with you um, National Principal Month, October's <laughs> National <laughs> Principal Month. And so I'm glad I was able to host um, the, the meeting here today. Um, you will also know that I'll be sending um, notes, I call them notes from the field, um, out to uh, teachers to just highlight um, the positive things that I'm seeing in classrooms to keep um, positive feedback for them. So we are expecting modeling of what we do to be the same thing that teachers do in the classroom. So that's it from Ben L. Unless you have any questions. I have one question, and, and this is particularly for our audience. Uh huh. Maybe you could explain what PBIS is. Oh, thank you. I do. Yes, we use an acronyms a lot: positive behavior um, invent, uh, intervention system, and it is meant to give six positives to every one correction. That's really sort of the formula for it, and it operates on the idea of um, positive reinforcements, celebrations. And um, I think all of our schools have the same expectations and hopefully, you're always at this end of the building when you have these meetings, but we have posters throughout the building, um, respect, responsibility, safety, and being ready to learn. The, some schools vary a little bit in their, in their definition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, turning the floor over to Principal Colley. Oh, hello and welcome to week five, day three. <laughs> <laughs> We're keeping track at our school and the kids are really getting pretty good at it. Um, I wanted to first extend uh, our thanks at Monument as a community and the staff for your um, wonderful card of recognizing what the staff had done to get everything on behalf of the board, Chris. Um, 
getting ready for the new year. And um, it was uh, a wonderful card. It was full of um, recognition and we appreciate that. And we share that, scan that and share that to all of our staff members, even our itinerant ones, so thank you. Um, our uh, attendance in September averaged 98% this month. Our school pictures have been taken, so we'll have some ID cards and the kids will be, smiles were wonderful. Um, we had a successful first stage one evacuation and shelter in place drill, supported by Vic Milani, um, our new safety director who has been supporting us and helping us um, greatly. It's been terrific to have him as a, um, a person that we can rely on for questions that we still have. Our vision screening with the Lions Club um, also occurred actually today for our entire school. They have this uh, equipment that is incredibly accurate and provides a result for a number of vision impairments for our children, free of charge, and um, it does it within a second. All they do is look into it, and in a second you have the results, which is wonderful. And they also do share that for any adult who wants to participate. We had a flu clinic um, conducted by Rite Aid for our staff members. Um, I actually didn't get to participate, but hoping that I can get mine as a follow-up soon. Our uh, after-school programming is up and running Monday through Thursday with 60% participation of our students. A variety of 11 options, including things like kindness rocks, fairy houses, football, flag football, and violin lessons. Really a nice um, uh, variety for all of our children, and seems to be that everyone who wanted to have something to go to did get to do that, and I actually have um, these to share. So you have a, um, an idea of each of those classes. Our band and chorus groups have begun 100% participation. So if children aren't playing an instrument, they are singing in chorus, which is wonderful. Set, uh, I think there's 27, 28 children band um, and uh, about the same in chorus. And we have our chorus for third grade and band is fourth and fifth grade. Um, and I had the pleasure of hearing and sharing uh, with the demonstration from Alice Music and also the rental night that was at Molly Stark, so it was fun to see the kids so excited and signing up for their instruments there. Our fall, fall benchmarking with FastBridge uh, occurred K through second grade, and our measures of academic progress uh, occurred three through five, and that's been completed. And our, given that, our teams have been working together, our collaboration team, our safety team, leadership team, our educational support team, the, they are meeting regularly, they're reviewing state, student data, um, building procedures, and we're just ensuring that the implementation with all of those teams are actually taking place, and that aligns according to our multi-tiered systems of supports, MTSS. Looking ahead, um, we will have a completion of our student risk screening scale. That acronym is SRSS. You may be familiar with that, and it's our behavior screening scale, so that will occur soon. Our core team of identified staff members will be working and participating in a training, professional learning trauma training with Dave Melnick. We'll be hosting and joining our Shaftesbury colleagues for that training that comes to our building, so we're pleased to have them. We're looking forward to the Scholastic Book Fair, the week of 1016, supported by our adults interested in monument, our AIM group. And, um, and it's an exciting week. We have a family night, and we also have an opportunity for all of our children's children to be supported by receiving one free book. Um, and that's thanks to that group and their fundraising that occurs. Harvest Night is coming up on October 26, where students and parents alike enjoy fall festive games. Um, and they also participate in a trunk or treat, which provides an opportunity for some safe alternative trick or treating for, for the children. Um, and last but not least, given that we had some changes in support in our pet policy, Second Chance Animal Shelter is coming back, and they do some wonderful programming on, with students about caring for animals and, and pets, and who knows, maybe we'll have a, a class pet this year too. Everything but a rat. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. And Principal Dr. Muges. It's hard to believe that uh, today is the 22nd day of the school year. 
in part because we had a week of winter-like weather followed by a week of summer-like weather, but also because of the way people hit the ground running. And I want to echo to Chris and the board uh, the appreciation for the card letter in the banner. And that was shared with the staff because the staff has been tremendous in coming in Tuesday, many working over the Labor Day weekend. Uh, I noted in, on Facebook, our school Facebook, how I believe it was last uh, Friday. I got in at 6.30, there were already two teachers there at 6.15. I left at 5.30, there were still a couple of other teachers there. So it, it's a reflection of their dedication, their ability to do what needs to be done to get the job done, and we're very grateful for that. So um, here we are after 22 days that have seemed pretty long, and I'm sure everyone's looking forward to the upcoming three-day weekend. We kicked off our $25,000 grant that we received from the Children's Literacy Foundation of Vermont and New Hampshire by having a representative of that group come in and present a free book to every one of our learners. In addition, we had a visiting author, Karen Gross, who ha has continued her work with us and our relationship with a sister school in Tanzania. And she's been working and will continue to come in and uh, with an ongoing uh, story that the kids are involved in crafting one of her next books. And continuing with books, uh, Brian Kuhn, who is with the um, Career Development Center in Buildings and Trades, and he and I went to Willowbrook because the CDC is going to um, build bookshelves that will hold uh, a few hundred books that we've collected so that the Willowbrook Community Center will have a free lending library and will make books accessible to learners at Willowbrook um, whenever school's not in session. And we have about one-eighth of all of our learners are from Willowbrook. So we hope that this will be a, a good opportunity to extend uh, their exposure to text and the availability of books. Our book fair was held last week, uh, throughout last week, and it coincided with our uh, open house. We had over 250 parents. So that's an increase from last year. And it's part of our ongoing efforts through Facebook or Twitter in addition to our print copies that go out every Friday in newsletter to keep parents informed and allow them uh, access to the school because we find that we get a lot more traffic on, on Facebook. It's, it's just people are more accustomed to it. They'll, they might have the app on their phone and they'll get something quickly and we're able to respond to that. We also held our first lockdown drill as well as a, a fire drill. And these are opportunities for our safety committee to then look and obtain feedback. What could we do better? What obstacles did we run into? And tighten up our protocol. And, and so that's something that we will continue to do working with Vic Milani. Our PTG, the parent teacher group, met. They have a very robust schedule as, yeah. as they always do, including Harvest Night, which is upcoming later this month, uh, a host of activities that are designed to, to bring in parents and form a bridge between home and school. I, I, I can now say a month has gone by since our welcome back barbecue and no one reported any illness from the hot dogs that I grilled, <laughs> but the uh, parent-teacher group sponsored that and it was very well attended. Uh, we had great weather and uh, it was a nice way to uh, connect with parents and families. We also started our MAPS test, and that will allow us to generate and access data that can then be converted into informed decision making in the classroom level. One of the things that we did, and, and I mentioned this um, at our last meeting, the third, second day of school, so we're now 22 days into our new master schedule. And not everything that can contribute to increased achievement scores can be associated with the number of teachers or the type of books or PD programs. In this case, um, the infrastructure of Molly Stark has changed significantly. Not just 
with a, a master schedule that allows grade level teams of classroom teachers, interventionists, and special education teachers to have the same common 40 minute planning period every time each day of the week. That promotes the communication and collaboration that's essential to activating any professional development or implementing any new textbooks. So we're working on that infrastructure so that people have the time to collaborate. Previously, um, one teacher at a grade level might have a 30 minute special in physical education while someone had a 50 minute. So automatically their schedules didn't align. It made it difficult to uh, traffic in learners to look at uh, groups according to skill deficits and um, make accommodations and adjustments from one grade to another. The other thing that we did is to relocate some of our classrooms so we no longer have a section of first grade here and the other two in an entirely opposite part of the building. And that too is something that can diminish collaboration and communication. So we're, we're looking at the infrastructure of our building which has impact on the organizational culture which has to be in place before we can make a big push in academics. So that's something that again doesn't translate into what PD are you doing, what textbooks are you using, and what tests. But those are critical foundations if we're going to optimize all of those other factors that I mentioned. Our after school program will begin next week. We have a, a, a large number of our learners involved in a variety of different activities from cooking to crochet to chess. Uh, seedlings is a component of our after school program. and. Uh, we like to see the school being used. So between morning daycare, after, after school daycare, and after school programming, um, there, there are people in our schools open almost as much as stewards. So uh, that's all I have for this presentation. Any questions? Great, thank you very thank much. You. Excellent. All right. So moving on to uh, number five, policies. So no, no policies to review, but we did have a discussion. We began a discussion uh, last month about how the um, communicable diseases policy really does not um, cover lice. Lice is included in there, but but perhaps that deserves its own policy. So uh, uh, Mary was going to look a little bit at the the admin regs. We're going to have a conversation with perhaps even uh, an action item of uh, asking our policy committee representative to bring it to the policy committee. But let's let's start with what's what we've come up with so far. Um, so just reviewing the, the policy 5140 for communicable diseases, um, the lice policy that we have right now is, is pretty limited. Um, and as everybody knows, to convene a policy committee can take several years to have it go full circle and to have anything actually come of it. Um, and I think there's a lot more people that know more about this subject than I do. I had a couple of ideas that I jotted down just from talking to members of the community, students and staff on ideas that we could implement in the school right away that would be relatively inexpensive but I think would have a lot of impact immediately. Um, so I think my request, I think the most reasonable request would be to convene some sort of a committee to work on the admin regs and then also review the policy for the future, especially since it's not considered a communicable disease any longer. It probably deserves its own policy entirely. Um, just as a parent, I know that each time a child comes down with lice in my household, it costs $86 per child and 10 to 16 loads of laundry per child and it gets extremely expensive. And that's somebody who has the money to spend $86 per child and has a washer and dryer that functions and can do 10 to 16 loads of laundry. Um, in a family that doesn't have access, um, these can be things that are completely um, out of reach for them. And um, children are distracted in class. There's discomfort. There can be secondary infections. These are just the quick things that I discovered about it. Um, so I think we need to look into it a little bit further and see if we can put something together to at least discuss admin regs with people that know more than I do. I have super easy ideas, inexpensive. We could purchase earbuds 
where each kid gets a set of earbuds and it has their name labeled on it and we have a box of earbuds in the school that are spare, um, cleaning them the headphones, moving hat and coat rack, hooks further apart, zapper combs, other schools are handing out zapper combs basically. Yeah. So, Mary, are you? There's ideas out there, and I'm sure there's more. There's better implementation ideas that can happen that are more practical. So, are you making a motion that we convene an ad hoc committee to develop modified admin regs regarding policy 5140? I am making a motion that we have an admin regs review of the lice policy, and okay. and we um, review it, and then also go f go through 5140 and see if. License be removed entirely. Okay, so is there a second to that motion? Second. Thank you, Chayla. Any further discussion? Dr. Kelly? When uh, I sat on that committee where we took it out <laughs> because it was not a, uh, a health hazard, mm -hmm. um, the nurses gave a presentation and they, they had like that much paperwork mm -hmm. you know, done on it. So rather than reinvent the wheel, maybe you could ask them. I have, actually. I okay. started with um, one, and then I moved on to a staff member out in Shaftesbury to ask what they're doing out in Shaftesbury. It was the and one in Palmo that had it, all oh, the information. Oh, okay. So the first thing that I found <coughs> to be interesting was that our, our school nurses, because they're not doing the checks as often as they used to, do not realize how much is coming through the building because parents are dealing with it at home and so they're not realizing what's going on. And Shaftesbury has a, some sort of a zapper comb um, that I have found, but the comb is expensive. And, you know, it still it doesn't take care of the washer and dryer piece. So I think, I think there's a lot to be looked at with it. And, um, but I do think there's some real simple, easy things that can be done within the school inexpensive and we can do it across the board that way nobody's being singled out and nobody feels that um, you know I, I think it can be relatively easy and then also reviewing the policy all right so any further discussion on the motion so all those in favor of the motion made to convene a committee to develop further admin regs regarding lice please signify by saying aye uh -huh. aye any opposed? Grant. So you should be clear that you'll present those to the policy committee. There is the you know, that so you can create an ad hoc committee that will make suggestions that to bring to to the SBSU policy committee, which where that would be mm -hmm. then. So delivered. was so that applied in the motion, Mary? Yeah. It was not because okay. so my my understanding is that. We would convene an admin reg committee to come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. It's presented to the policy committee, and it can be amended. Right. That, but, that's but then the said. policy committee to, to redo 5140 and remove life's policy is a separate issue. That's so a separate issue. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. but the, the admin regs will eventually be incorporated by that committee, by the SU committee, right? Okay, okay great. Uh, so moving on to field trips, so there was a request to review, uh, I think specifically uh, from Jackie Peru to discuss nature's classroom, um, but I thought it, it fitting to sort of expand it to talk about uh, field trips in general. So we had a little bit of a discussion last week uh, regarding policy 6230. Last week? Last month, rather. Thank you. <laughs> um, time flies, you know, it just seems like a week ago. Uh, I, we had asked Renee for some figures. She was great about getting them to us. So all BSD schools have transportation budget line items for field trips. Ben L has a, a transportation line item of a little over 2,000. Molly, a little over 3,000. Monument, a little over 1,000. Plus, there's a continuation in the current budget of $25,000 being allocated specifically for Nature's Classroom for the three schools. Um, and reading from Renee's email. And during our final budget meeting, the board added $50,000 into the budget for extra field trip transportation, which is to be divided up between all three schools. Okay, can I interrupt you for just a Please. minute? I don't think Edie was here last year, so she doesn't know about this thing. About it's for fifth grade. I, I, I'm oh. familiar with Nature's Classroom well, because yes. 
So, so we can certainly have a conversation about Nature's Class, or I know that at least one of the one of the BSD schools is in full throw in terms of fundraising. Um, but something occurred to me while I was thinking about this, and that, um, although you know, I I've, I personally have had a son go through Nature's Classroom, and he, he had a great time, uh, as did men members of his class. Nature's Classroom is a business, though. It's a private. It's a privately owned business. Um, so it strikes me that the board should not be setting aside money specifically for one business. If it's if it's a line item, if if this business is contracted with the SU, then by all means, we, we know there's a process for that. But it occurs to me that since we're going to be moving into budget budget season soon, I am all in favor of allocating money for field trips. I think it perhaps puts us on shaky ground if we're specifying the business that we're only going to allow a certain chunk of money to go to. So that's my two cents, and certainly we can have that conversation moving forward in terms of next year's budget. Um, but uh, Jackie Prue, since you were the one who asked to talk about Nature's Classroom, I'll turn it over to you first. I just wanted to know if um, the other schools were getting ready to do that. I know that um, there had been some talk. I know from Merity that Mount, a monument's well on their way to raising their money, their half of the money, and um, planning it. They've got their teachers ready, and I wasn't sure what was going to happen with your school. Or so I'm, I'm learning about how it's working here. Yeah. And so where I came from, the sixth grade class and parents did their own fundraising, usually yeah. through, through sports and, and events and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And, and I know from having those folks come and visit us, I know that they do everything possible to do um, scholarships and tuitions yep. and that sort of thing. And in looking at, at sort of the challenges that we had in making everything equitable, I was thinking about, the, we called this field studies. We had it connected to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it was only for one grade level. And so the mm -hmm. idea of putting it into the, the school budget as an instructional line item that would be for um, field study for fifth grade was one of the brainstorms that, that I had come up with because the fundraising is a tremendous um, burden um, in, in some communities and it, it really does depend on what we think the learning advantages are of this program and I found the learning advantages to be extremely um, advantageous to the to the group of students I was working with last year so that was just another way of looking at it no at Benel we have not done anything about fundraising for this because I know last year that you're um, you weren't here <laughs> so you don't know but I know last year um, that Jerry O'Connor got involved um, late in it but he did um, there was a couple of teachers they weren't on the fifth grade level um, but there was a couple teachers that volunteered to go um, and support the children and um, they helped Molly Stark and Ben L parents formed a group together and they raised the money that they needed to raise and you have to raise it's approximately half the money right so I'm on the nature's classrooms field study for a <laughs> monument school and um, I had sent an email at the beginning of the school year I think it was the first week of the year to um, everybody that I thought were integral players in each of the different buildings to invite them to work with monument because while I've never done the fundraising for the program um, all the previous parents prime us for years in advance that you are going to have to buckle down and really work. And it is no joke. We are working every single possible day to get a bake sale out at the monument, to get a bake sale up at the Welcome Center. We've got a GoFundMe page. Um, so my email had just um, said to everybody that I thought would be interested in potentially discussing it, even if we didn't want to work together, it would be to brainstorm ideas of what Monument has done in the past to raise the funds. And um, up until last year, um, Monument raised the funds in whole. So I'm told it was $11,000 just for our school to go. Yeah, um, and it's extremely time consuming. Yes. And there is some real fundraising fatigue that goes on with the parents that are involved. Mm -hmm. So now that that has essentially been cut in half, 
it's still a hustle. But um, with, you know, we have a parent group that has convened and we are working 10 o'clock last night. I was emailing with another parent and working on GoFundMe pages and trying to find volunteers to do a bake sale today, which we ended up not being able to man. But um, it's a lot of work. So the offer is still out there. If you have a representative from Benel or from um, Molly, vice versa, wrong principal, sir. Um, we're happy to talk to you guys and give you the ideas that we've been given in the past. Um, but we're up to about $1,000 now. And, and our, my personal goal is to have this almost completely done by the end of winter. I would like to personally be done because it's a lot of work. And, and I just might also um, add to that, since trans there is a transportation line, mm -hmm. that is a significant amount of money that will not be need to be raised. Right. I'd, I'd like to ask a question. Please. One of the things that happened last year uh, when we talked about this uh, was that schools choose whether they want to do this or not. Uh, that this shouldn't be, as, as you stated, because it's a, a money-making opportunity for a company, mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't be the sole thing that we look at. And, and maybe we're, we should look at our fifth grade students and ask that team or that school to decide how they want to spend that money, rather than for the board to say, you spend it this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just want to mention, I have been asked um, by two parents at Molly, but um, I told them I wasn't helping them fundraise this year. <laughs> I spent many hours last year um, getting this going. Um, but Andrea, who did was the head of all the fundraising last year for the Ben Allen and Molly um, group, um, will advise one of the parents mm -hmm. from Molly, if they go forward, and that we've t we've took it, taken advantage of that as well. We have parents of previous grades that have given us their what what raised the most money the fastest. What did they ha What had the most bang for their buck? You know, school dances, and right now for us it's bake sales and trying to um, utilize our tourist traffic as much as we can. So, was the expectation that all fifth grade students would go? Mm -mm. And that for all five days, because there are different options for, for the well, trip. Well, that's what we um, <clears throat> we started out with last year. It's entirely up to you. I'm not going to fight this battle decision. anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think that parents need to make that decision, really. I mean, whether they're, they want their child to be away yeah. from their house for five days. But I think that Molly Stark and Ben L have to, as a as a school, decide, mm -hmm. you know, with parents' involvement mm -hmm. and with staff involvement, whether they, as a school, want to participate this year. Yeah. That probably should be a decision made sooner rather than later, as mm -hmm. the fundraising is kicking in and what direction the school is going to go. Because what was the? I know it was the first year, so it's tough to make a judgment on participation based on a year, and it was late. But you were. We had 22 of 64. But Ben L had most of their students right. go. So it, it goes back to what Jack, um, Dr. Kelly mentioned <coughs> that it could have been unique to that year, but we may be giving something that the kids don't want. Um, the kids that didn't go had field trips to uh, local field trips and programs at the Bennington Museum, uh, the Science Museum in Schenectady, the State Museum uh, in New York State Museum, and they, they had an alternative every day. The kids who went really enjoyed um, outdoor classroom, the nature's classroom. Um, the kids who didn't go enjoyed what they did, and I, and I think that Already there's an expectation that Molly Stark is going to Nature's Classroom and, and we did speak to a parent who asked about uh, setting up a meeting to have someone from Nature's Classroom, which we did. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So we're set up November 2nd that interest classroom reps would come in, and I think that we're going to extend an invitation to Ben Al Thank you. and Monument to see if they want to uh, meet in Molly Stark and have one big presentation. But ultimately, um, to Chris's point, that not only is it to a, a business, but there are other alternatives too. There are other providers, and if we were going to buy a new math textbook, I think we would probably look at more than one. So there's the notion of, is it solely nature's classroom as opposed to outdoor education on the other side of the lake, or any other number of, of things. Um, ideally, it would be nice if there was a facility like that in Vermont that, that would keep the money in Vermont. Um, the, the other notion is, do all three schools have to go? Do they have to go to the same place? And, um, you know, I'm mindful of uh, an explanation of uh, a dog food company that had invested millions and millions of dollars in a new product. And they were losing money. And it didn't work. And the CEO convened all the department heads. What did you do in sales? Well, we increased sales, we, we put salesmen out. Um, how about marketing? We had coupons, we had discounts, we did this. How about our nutritionist? It's got the right vitamins and this and that. Well then if everyone did the right thing, why are we losing money? And it was an intern in the back room that raised her hand and said, maybe the dogs just don't like the food. <laughs> and, and I think we have to be wary of that. Now, just because only one third of the learners at Molly Stark went last year doesn't mean that we're going to get a similarly low percentage uh, this year. But I think that in retrospect, we moved ahead before we knew if any staff members wanted to go and before we knew if the kids wanted to go. So at this point, it seems like the assumption is that the schools are going to uh, nature's classroom. And, and when I uh, spoke to the parent who uh, I think indicated that they had been, been contacted from someone at Monument, that she reached out to see what evenings that they could come down and we agreed on November 2nd. And the, the concern I have about fundraising is that um, it was a stretch to meet the amount of funds necessary with only a third of our kids going last year. And, and it could be attributed to be starting late. Next year's fifth grade is 85. It's 20 more kids times the amount of money and divided by half. We would be looking at 16,000 that we'd have to raise. And that, that grade would have to start now at the same time our current fifth grade if they're going to raise 16,000. That, that's a concern that I have. Mm -hmm. But mostly that when we had the evening and encouraged parents to attend and, and learn about Nature's Classroom, which is a, a great program. There, there's no question it's, it's um, well organized and educational. But we only had a third of them go. And is it a class trip if only a third of the kids go? Correct. Which is a good point. So those are those are issues I think that we have to continue. Well it sounds like you're on progress to to stop that progress. Yes. If you're you're having a parent meeting on the second. And then uh, the next step would be, I imagine, poll your faculty for involvement and see, you know, what type of feedback that you have to what participation looks like, and then you know, hopefully that will yield that the results you want, and whether we move forward with nature's classroom or seek alternatives. So would we send that um, questionnaire out to the parents again to see if they would be? Interested in and have and like as that we did last year, we deadline. Have a link to the website, so if they want to um, review the website, which is very informative, so they can get an idea of the programs, um, 
we'll remind them that there were 22 kids in last year, so their parents, some of whom may still have another fifth grader, will have some um, opportunity to, to talk, and we could ask some of the fifth graders went last year to speak at November 2nd and, and go from there. But I, I, I believe that we're inviting Monument and Ben Allen parents if they wish to hear that presentation so that the group doesn't have to come down three different times. So in the interest of time, um, we'll let each, uh, I'm happy to let each building principal kind of manage and take the temperature of, of the, the school community. Um, but, but thank you for all the input. Thank you for the, for the conversation mm -hmm. around it. Jackie, I'll give you 35 seconds. That's Go all for I them. need. Okay. Chris, you made a comment about um, Nature's Classroom being a business. Um, I didn't think of it that way when we, um, when Jackie and I posed this to the board two years ago. Um, we just were looking at equity with Monument, um, Shaftesbury, and Woodford at the time. We and that's the program they sure. they had chosen. So that's what we were looking mm -hmm. at. Yep. So you know, is equity in terms of equal opportunity or yes. equity in exactly the same? And it sounds like. In the effort to reach Equal equity of opportunity, we mm -hmm. landed on the same. And anyway, it, it's a matter for the for the next budget season. But but certainly, I, I don't think there was any um, ill will or, or or nastiness behind it. I think it was absolutely done with the interest of the kids in mind, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it still should be by school choice. Yep, for sure. So moving on to number seven, I, I see that we have uh, Don Campbell here, who is the chair of the Act 46 committee, who has been very patient throughout all of our other conversations this evening. Um, but as the Act 46 committee is the first committee report, I would like to invite Don up to uh, speak a little bit about Act 46, also to have uh, Dan Monks, who is one of our representatives along with Chela, to kind of give a, a brief outline, if possible, um, and if you so choose to address some of the concerns that may have been raised uh, earlier today, earlier this evening. Okay, so a brief outline of where we are or how we've gotten here. What's your, what's this, where are we we gonna vote what's your for? level of... Uh, what are we going to vote for? Yeah, where we are and what is going to be happening on the 7th. What will voters be asked to weigh in on on the 7th? Okay, okay. Uh, well, the very general setup is that, um, as you know, Act 46 is now the law of the land. And so we have um, legislation in place that we've been working on for... In, in various study committees for two and a half years to try to figure out a way to get through this. And um, it's hard to hear a comment like this was rushed through when we've been kind of working on this for two and a half years. But um, I suppose we could have taken five years to get through it, but there's a deadline. We're trying to work uh, to get this done by November 30th, at which point we would no longer be able to take care of any of the financial incentives, and at, at which point we will no longer have any uh, the best options open to us. So we did work under a deadline this summer, but we had the um, we had the advantage of working with the work of the previous two Act 46 committees, uh, which Jackie Pru was involved with, and among others. And um, I'm glad to hear the numbers are good at Ben L. Um, but the overall trend, as everybody knows, is that they're creeping down around the state, and they're creeping down in our in our student union, in, in our supervisory union too. Uh, and most national studies indicate that there's an optimal size for a school district. Those studies are often cited, they're cited in Act 46, they're cited in that piece that, that George Sleeman gave us, they're, they're kind of out there. And they mostly pin the optimal size for a, a school district at about uh, 2,000 to 4,000 students. And that's optimal both in terms of uh, delivery of education, but also delivery of special services and delivery of transportation and efficiency of uh, use of staff and management of money and everything else. There is some evidence to show that when you start getting districts that are larger, uh, you begin to lose efficiency, but most, uh, most of those are talking about kind of 15,000 and up. Vermont has the, um, the smallest, second smallest average school district size in the entire country by far. And so this legislation is really um, asking towns to do something that the rest of the country did during the 20s, 30s, and 40s, which was to consolidate some of their small school districts. Um, we've, we are not consolidating schools at this point, but the, the legislation has asked us to consolidate governance. So the school boards would be uh, combined into a more efficient, streamlined system. So what's being voted on is a merger proposal that the Act 46 committee came up with, and it's um, 
really more about the structure of governance and not so much about what the, you know, what the board would uh, do. The, the Act 46 committee's job is not to set out the uh, guiding principles of the board. It's not to set out um, the core values. It's not to set out the work plan. It's to set it up. And then that board, once uh, voted in place, would, uh, would create a public process, through a public process, would create a district-wide equitable education delivery system and that then there would be opportunity for public input you know at that level so the um in order to make the november 30th deadline we're, we're holding a vote on november 7th for the merger and that uh that vote will be not only for whether or not the district wants the, the districts involved which are shaftesbury bennington Connell, and woodford and I should pause just for a minute to let some of you know, if you don't already know, that a, an hour or two ago, Powell re-voted whether or not to warn the issue, and they have decided to um, to put it to the voters instead of having the school board decide. And so there will be a vote in all four uh, school districts at this point. North Bennington will not be voting, um, partly because they didn't fit into the merger proposal that we created because of their school choice, and um, and that was well well vetted along the way. So we'll be voting both on the merger proposal, but we'll also be voting on directors for the new district. And this new district, um, it's a little bit awkward the way the setup is, but by statute, we have to vote on the directors at the same time as we vote on the merger proposal. So it would have been nice if we could have voted on the merger proposal first and then voted on directors, uh, because why put everybody through running for director if the merger is not accepted? But um, by statute, we have to do them together. So um, petitions are out for people, and I would you know, certainly let this board know and, and have you let the people you know uh, know about this, that uh, petitions are out for uh, those director positions. And what one needs to do is pick it up from the town clerk, from the town clerk of your town, get 30 signatures from people in your town, and bring that uh, petition back to the town clerk by October 10th which is next Tuesday. And I know a number of people have taken out petitions already, so uh, we have, we have, uh, we know that there are a lot of people that are working on getting their signatures in case the board, uh, in case the merger does happen. So, um, I don't think we want to go into the, I don't think I want to go into a long, dog and pony show about why the merger should happen. I think that it's pretty clear that the state is very, very, um, they are clear that they are going to merge into efficient scale school districts. And so I, I realized there was a comment at the beginning of the, um, at the beginning of the meeting that stated that the state wouldn't merge us. I believe that's wrong. I believe it's ill-informed. Um, and so I'm not trying to use scare tactics when I say that the state has created legislation and they've enumerated in several bits of legislation that they intend to follow through with it. So I think the, the bottom line is, um, and, and this is really probably important for the Bennington School District, is that the merger proposal has a lot of different things in it. it it protects the small schools a, a little bit more than they would be protected if the state did it. Uh, there are, yes, there are financial incentives that, that are actually very substantial in the, in the sort of millions of dollars, but, but those aren't really the best reason to do it. You know, the best reason to do it is, is because we think it's the best for our school system. And if, um, if we can get to the point where we can agree that student populations are declining, uh, mergers are going to happen. If we don't do something, school closings may come. Probably the best thing for us to do is to band together as a community, and by that I mean not just Bennington, but Bennington, Shaftesbury, Powell, North Bennington if they'd like, Woodford, and to seek strength in numbers, try to be a strong district together, and see if we can um, chart our own future. So the, the gist of it is take out, if you want to run for director, hurry up and get your signatures, get your petition in, to your town clerk by October 10th. And um, we will have some public information meetings that we haven't planned it yet, but we're going to have something at the high school 
Uh, if people are interested in that, we have some information that we'll be getting out um, by social media to kind of help people understand what the, some of the nitty-gritty details are. But um, hopefully uh, everybody who cares about the future of education in this area will be voting on November 7th. How's Take that? it down. Will you take some questions from the from the board, please? Sure. Okay, so I'll go first. Okay. Cheers, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, um, because this is a, a a revamped governance structure, is it then fair to say that because it is not a revamped um, um, instructional structure, that we would not see some of the some of the um, features that, that Lori had asked about. We, we're not necessarily going to see in the Articles of Agreement uh, a structure for uh, providing for students on IEPs. We're not necessarily going to see uh, an outline of how we're going to provide for students on 504 plans because that's not the nature of this document. Exactly. Is that fair to say? I, I hate to say it, but the merger proposal is dry governance stuff. You know, it's really not about uh, the, what's most important to all of us, which is how are we gonna improve, edu continue to improve, it, improve education? How are we gonna uh, provide the best services to our children and the most efficient transportation services and things like that? Those, those are all left to the future board. Uh, just in the same way that the Mount Anthony board, which is in existence right now, manage many of those things. This new, um, newly formed uh, Mount Anthony Unified School District would potentially um, wrap all of those issues in and, and um, and hopefully create a, a better, stronger system. But, so, but that's not for the Act 46 to decide. Right. And we're not qualified to decide. There are, as you know, there are school board members on Act 46 committee, and there are citizens like me who aren't really deeply involved in the education system, but have been have become so because it's so important to our community for so many other reasons. And so is it also fair to say then that um, there's nothing in Act 46 that would address how uh, ESSA will be applied, how state statutes will be applied, how standardized tests will be applied. None of that is going to be addressed, so there's no worry that just because it's not listed in the Articles of Agreement doesn't mean schools don't that, have to that's do right. that. That's we, we weren't, right. We weren't right. able to address some mm -hmm. of that stuff. We did, we did slip in a few very minor things which the, the, the uh, Agency of Education allowed us to put in, and one of them is a, um, a yet-to-be-defined inter-district school choice. So there would be some ability for students to move within public schools in the newly formed district. So say you're living in Shaftesbury, but you work in Powell, and it's more convenient for your child to go to school in Powell, you would have the ability to um, have the student go in Powell. Or say you're in, the, in, a, in a school system and you're not happy, it's not working, the teachers aren't working for you, you have an opportunity to work uh, within the system to easily um, move to some other school. Uh, make a lateral move to some other school. Details of that haven't been worked out. They're tricky, transportation, a bunch of other things. But, uh, but we were able to work into our articles that we would like the new district to, to offer um, this. If we're going to combine finances and we're going to combine governance, then it feels like not a big thing to ask that people could have the flexibility to move within schools if they'd like to. Thank you. Question? Yes. Um, we already share much of what goes into governance. For instance, the teacher contract. We all share that. And uh, we share um, special educators. So I think it's just particularly money and, and how we support schools, uh, which is affected. The, the other thing is, uh, you know, you talked about student mobility, but is there also teacher mobility? Because in, in the last contract that, that we signed off for, for teachers, um, we said that <clears throat> if a teacher was teaching in the BSD and then moved, moved to Shaftesbury, that they would carry their um, longevity with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly one of the attractive points. I should probably get Jim to speak to that. You want to jump I, I'll, in? I'll, I'll take that one. That's going to be subject to contract negotiations, you mm -hmm. know, because the con we have a unified contract, but there are provisions that would have to be renegotiated. But certainly, the Act 46 Study Committee has promoted that as a positive, that you know, staff can be transferred between school systems. You mentioned um, sp uh, special education. Because they are currently SBSU employees, they can be, but that's really the only employee group that they can. So, but we see that as a positive to be able to shift and share resources that 
may be a, an attractive way to, to get teachers, but particularly specialists when you're offering somebody a part-time art teacher job as opposed to maybe a full-time art teacher job that we can share easily. We do some sharing now, but it, it's a complicated payroll issue to, to share people. So in, in many ways, it, this would be a bonus for us. Well, that's the hope, and, and that it would lead to not only more um, better working conditions for teachers as it has in Chittenden County and some of the other districts that merged early, um, but that it would also uh, lead to greater job satisfaction uh, for teachers and, and the possibility of combining part-time jobs, as, as Jim said, into uh, you know potential full-time <coughs> jobs, but deploying teachers in other places. It also leaves open the possibility, although this is subject to you know future motivation on the community's parts, of creating the phrase people know as magnet schools, but but essentially having sc different schools become good at uh, different things. So you might have one school that's particularly good at computer science. And if you're really good at computer science and your your school's not strong at that, you have the ability to kind of to move over there. Or so music or language. Well, the or structure of all so. elementary schools currently are pretty much the same. And that's right. what, what Don's referring to, what was discussed at many of the Act 46 studies we made, is that individual schools can have a individual focus. That certainly would be the hope, but as Don pointed out, this is the Act 46 study committee. They can give a charge to this new committee if and when it's formed, uh, but the, and certainly show what the intent of the Act 46 study committee was, but they can't impose that on right. them. We kind of set up the bones, and then the new district board would, would put the meat on it and, mm -hmm. and make it. And uh, then there's a, a, there's a five year, uh, a five year ban, so, so to speak, for closing schools, correct? Right, so we had a lot of conversation about that, and this is another one of those ill-informed points. So the, the people who are saying this proposal is designed to close schools are dead wrong, okay? So the, the, this proposal actually extends the protection for small schools, like it or not, um, from the, the state number, which is four years, to five years. But it also requires, and this is really important, it requires that the newly formed board, which would be, uh, which would be distributed the same way the Mount Anthony board is, a portion of the same way the Mount Anthony board is, that they would have to vote by a, a 75% supermajority over two years to close a school. So effectively, that means it would probably be about seven years before a school could be closed if you could get a 75% majority of that board. Now, if if Bennington has four votes and Shaftesbury has two and North Bennington has two and Powell has two and Woodford has one, I think our, our, the, uh, the position of the Act 46 committee is it's a very strong setup that's worked well for MAU over the years and, and it represents all the different communities adequately. Now, Powell doesn't have the same vote as Bennington, but they have enough of a vote that they stay at the table. Same for Shaftesbury, <coughs> same for North Bennington and that this balance that was struck in 1975 and has served us well since then can continue to serve us well. Yeah, I, I almost think we're, we're a forerunner of what happened, but I could be wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, how about subcommittees? For instance, um, could Shaftesbury have a little subcommittee and, the, and they bring their concerns to the board and, and the Powell bring their concerns? Yeah. Many, many school districts are setting those up that have been merged or setting them up so that there is a forum for them to be able to kind of Community, community, community Advisory board. Committee. Community oh, that's, advisory that's committee. wonderful. Yep, yeah. and so, so fear, scare tactics go both ways, right? That there's this sort of notion that this is a mega board and, and that nobody's going to have a voice anymore, but that's just simply not the case. If you, if you, have, uh, if you have a board that of responsible citizens, you know, that's been competitively elected because a lot of our boards, seats go unopposed or people get written in, you know, because we, we, we have so many board members. If we have one board of really high quality, very concerned individuals, um, there, and, and we have these advisory committees in the different towns, there will be a lot of opportunities for input. And there probably, hopefully, will be a lot more input than there is now. I enjoyed reading Tim Scoggins's piece in the <laughs> paper about having gone to Shaftesbury meetings for whatever a year or two, and he was the only person there. Uh, so I think 
I think I local control. I agree that Shaftesbury Board does whatever I tell them to do. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, local control is important to all of us, but but it, it depends how you define local control. And I consider local, and I think the Act 46 committee has come to consider local our friends and our neighbors that live in Shaftesbury, Pownall, North Bennington, Woodford. You know, that that to me is what feels like local control. So, and if all this merging goes through. Uh, if the whole thing gets merged, I, I, I don't know what it is in real pupils, but equalized pupils, it's something like 3,200 students. It's right in the middle of um, the 2,000 to 4,000 range that is considered optimal by most national studies. So we're, we're in the ballpark, and we already know it, right? Because we're already kind of functioning like that. Well, yeah. so, so it seems pretty unlikely that the state's going to come down and say, oh, yeah, you should tear apart that that supervisory union that they have, you know, mm -hmm. it seems much more likely they're going to come down and say, oh, it's already there. You're merged. Right. And so as long as that's going to happen anyway, and in the reality, committee wants to direct that and get the little things we can in there, a little extra protection for schools, inter-district school choice, mm -hmm. and um, several million dollars of tax incentives. And, and the and real work would be once that committee, so like you asked about subcommittees. I, as superintendent, I could envision this committee would have some subcommittees that we don't currently have. Like you might have a subcommittee for elementary education, mm -hmm. and a subcommittee for high you know education. early ed um, and high school, right? Because mm -hmm. th that deal with those specific issues that report back to the to the full board. Because it, obviously it, it's going to be a transition. I mean, you're not this board is not going to if this board goes through one change. You'll see you're not going to see seven principals lining up giving you know principal reports. It, as exciting as they are. But they might be more relevant. <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, they, but um, more likely report to a sub board or something like that. At, you know, and you might see them cycle back. Once we don't know. We don't know what this what this board would there, do. There is a little bit of a, you just have to kind of trust that this is, this is going to work out at some level. I know that sounds thin. But it's not us and them. It's not like we're giving up control to Montpelier. And so that we, we are simply saying that we would like, as with Mount Anthony, uh, we would like to have a group of our local citizens making decisions for our schools. So it's not giving up, it's just changing a little bit. It's adapting, adapting to the declining student numbers, adapt, adapting to the need for efficiency, adapting to the need to better utilize resources, teachers, technology, and um, hopefully make it so that our, our supervisory union does more than just manage boards and can instead be thinking about education and be thinking about delivery of services. I'm sorry, I've, I've delved into a pitch here. I didn't mean to. I meant to just give you an update, but, and it's not really a pitch. It, it's just that it, it feels so clear to me that uh, change is coming. We can either direct it or we can get walloped by it. And, and I'm in the camp that we should try to direct it the best we can. So. Any other questions for Don? Jackie, yes, please. Uh, it's not a question. Okay. Um, it, no, it's just a comment. I've had several phone calls asking me from elderly people that don't have any idea what this means. Mm -hmm. So um, you need a community meeting, mm -hmm. several of them. Yeah, we so as soon as you get them scheduled, they need to be published because yeah. I, my thing is I can't tell you how to vote. You need to go to the public meetings. I, yeah. I think the Act 46 committee certainly had that planned. And it was all, no, they didn't want any meetings prior to last okay. Thursday's carousel. And then with what happened with Pownall, that even got held back to see what if Pownall was going to do a special meeting, which as you heard Don say they did tonight, but um, that clearly is the intent of the committees. That's their next step. And I know Don's been central office frequently working on flyers with my administrative mm -hmm. assistant. and. So pretty much ready to go, and uh, you heard a yeah. So we have some information ready yeah. to go out, but Jackie, it's such a you're so right about this. It's such a nuanced law. It doesn't fix everything. It's just a little. It's a it's a it's an improvement. It's a step along the way, but it's not a big broad change that um, that everybody can immediately understand. It's as you know from having tried to lead the committee right for so long. I mean, you did lead the committee, and and. It, and there was so much uncertainty along the way. It was very, very it's difficult. A complicated looking ballot. So it's com very complicated looking ballot, multiple pages. Uh, you can't just walk into the voting booth and, and read it and vote. You know, you, you really have to do your homework ahead of time to understand what it's about. So we are going to try to put out summaries to let people know, you know, what the gist of it is. And um, 
that's always dangerous. You know, when you summarize a complicated thing, it's always dangerous to try to pare it down to the irreducible minimum. But um, we're going to give it our best shot, and, and hopefully we can um, hopefully we can get people voting uh, from a position of strength, you know, from a position of understanding it and actually thinking that it's best for our community, which is, which is what I feel. But again, for this to work, for it to be an improvement, we need good directors. We need good directors. If, if the merger happens, we need good directors, and so it's really important uh, for the people who are um, clear thinking and, and hardworking and passionate about education to make sure they get their signatures in and uh, get on the ballot just in case the merger happens so that we have a strong board in the case it does. Thanks for that. Else got that done, thank long you. update. But well, no, it was per, but it was great though. So you'll hear this again from us, but since we have you here, thank yeah. you. You you were one of the the folks who stepped forth from the Bennington community to volunteer to sit as a community participant on this board, and then you ended up chairing the whole thing. And I think you've done an exemplary job. So thank you very much. For well, all nice that Bennington's not the last cow through the cattle gate, right? You know, <laughs> so two thirds of. Uh, Vermont has already figured this out, yeah, and, right. and many more have successful propos proposals in the work. I, I'm pleased that our community is has a strong proposal that we can put forward. I'm pleased that our communities have decided to vote on it, including Pownell, and um, we'll we'll try to let people know the details as much as possible, and then we'll we'll follow the will of the community. I would like to point out that uh, so far we've had metaphors uh, likening uh, Bennington to now cows and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> just, just pointing that out. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what's next. Some people like pets, some people like farms. <laughs> so, thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, could we please have an SVSU committee update? Um, sure. Um, it was, it was, you know, nothing earth shattering. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I think the notes are out there and available, and I don't think there's anything specific of note that I want to call out. Okay, very good. Um, Would you agree with that, Meredith? Yeah, it was very cut and dry. We talked mm -hmm. about Act 46, but sure. there's no need to talk about that again. Right. Um, and we did have a presentation about um, a new. Um, I don't have my notes in front of me, so. Integrated field review. Thank you, the integrated field review that will be occurring um, with the SU where um, it's a something that's um, being um, developed by the state and that, that, can, that this um, review now comes in and kind of reviews how our school operates and um, um, the benefits and the efficiencies within our school and then then representatives from our school would be going and if I understood that correctly and please correct me Jim I'm wrong on anything would be going to that other school to participate on on that level as well um, and it just um, they'll provide a <coughs> report of um, their of the review of the findings and uh, and that I think is on the 7th of November, if I'm remembering my date correctly. Mm -hmm. And I only remember that date because it's the same date as the vote. Same day. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, and then for a facilities committee, uh, with the understanding that Jim is also going to be speaking to some elements uh, left over from the last time. But Jackie, is there anything you'd like to put No, forward? there was, we haven't had a meeting or anything. Um, and then Jim's supposed to update us on okay. everything. What about the food committee? We haven't met. Do you know when you're going to meet? I think that I can was look born for, for this week. Thank you. When is it? I knew it's coming up. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I saw it in my calendar. Um, but Thursday. as of yet, we have not met. Tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. And I said Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. I it's Thursday. one for Thursday. Third Thursday. Third yeah. Thursday? Yeah. And where? Middle school. Middle school. Middle school. What time? 3.45 at the middle school. Calendar. Yeah. So why are you going to say that the food committee Banana bread. is only going to be meeting quarterly, where they used to meet monthly. They'll go back to monthly meetings if it's a contract year for food service, but they're, they're going to be monthly, uh, quarterly. So that's quarterly. why you haven't had a meeting. So the next agenda item is a discussion of a board retreat. So way back in April, we had talked about um, doing a board retreat. Uh, and the idea at the time was that there were there were three brand new board members, one returning uh, slash newish board member, and three uh, experienced board members uh, who had continued to serve. And the notion was that we you know needed to get ourselves put together. And um, 
almost entirely due to my fault. Uh, that was not done in a timely manner. And so the question now is, we are now cl closer to the next election than we are to the most recent in the lecture. Um, we may very well see this board look exactly like it looks right now uh, after um, a meeting day in March. There may be some changes. So one question is, do we want to postpone a board retreat until after the next election? And if the answer to that is no, um, we need to look at when. Because we had, uh, when I spoke with uh, Nicole Mace and the crew up at Vermont School Board Associations, uh, Association, um, they put forth some weekend days, and no single weekend day worked for everyone on the board. And in order for this to do what we want it to do, we all need to be there, obviously. So the alternative, as I see it, is to do one or two sort of evening workshops. So the question that I put before the board, the first one is, uh, and I don't know that we necessarily need to formalize this with a vote, but just sort of a show of hands. Um, do we want to still feel the need to do a board retreat now? And if so, are we cool with moving it to the notion of, a, of one or two evening workshops? And I'll let anyone take the floor who would like it. I'm fine with the evening workshops. Okay. In an effort to expedite That's having saying, the meetings and other ones for me too. Okay. So what I would like then, please, as long as there are no dissenting opinions in that, yep. Well, <clears throat> traditionally a, a retreat is not warned. Am I correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has to be. So, no so my understanding it? is that it would, there, there's a line item that falls under training and development for the board. Um, mm -hmm. So if this is framed as, as training, training for the board and not as a board meeting, so there are no decisions will be made necessarily, That's no right action right. will be made. Anything that we decide as a board that we want to maybe make an official part of our, of our workings would need to be brought to a board meeting for a public vote. That's right. Um, so it's really just kind of us. There's no action items at this at all. Yeah, so it would be us sort of learning better how to be a board. Okay. And, and uh, how long? Uh, so Nicole said that it could be uh, around three hours in the evening okay. sometime. And uh, so once? Once or twice. If, if the consensus is that we do still want to do this, what I would ask is maybe in the next week people email me ideas for what they want to see covered. I'll give those to Nicole. Um, Nicole can tell me what she can come up with. She'll throw out some dates. Uh, and because we're doing planning, we can do this via email too. So, well, my my suggestion is to do it in uh, January, or February, only only because you know, like from now, I mean, first you, you know, you have all these holidays coming up, mm -hmm. and if we wait to January, we're going to be meeting every week for a budget. Oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah, we have to do it before <laughs> budget. <Yeah. laughs> hmm. Hopefully, hopefully we're done by Just January. Just want to remind you, more December do it before would be budget. budget. Yeah. <laughs> So, so if folks can give me an email in the next week, please, I'll reach out to Nicole uh, in a week from now, and then we'll get some things scheduled. All right, thank you for that. Uh, and turning to Superintendent Culkeen for your report, please. There's not much left because we talked about integrated field review in Act 46. So, but I will say um, we had over 12 members of all our supervisory unions at two days of training. At Killington on Monday and Tuesday this week for the integrated field review. This is a, a new concept from the state. Those of you may be familiar with what a NEASC evaluation is, which they come in, New England Association of School and Colleges, usually with high schools. They come in, they send a team in of educators, each one focusing on a certain aspect, you know, administration, physical plant, curriculum, staffing. So it's similar to that, only it's pre-K through 12. So I don't know, there was, um, I estimate well over 100 Vermonter educators there Monday and Tuesday. Um, you're right, that, it's, this was training. So for us to participate in this training, we also have to agree that we're all going to go and do an evaluation of another school. Uh, and those are different days. So November 7th, they're coming here. Some of our, our educators will be going as early as this month. I'm slated to go, uh, I think, November 21st to um, Baton Kill Valley and spend a day there doing theirs. And um, then we generate reports from our site visit following a set criteria that then that gets presented back to that sending school. Uh, Vermont AOE piloted this last year with uh, other schools and they were pleased with the result and 
now are moving forward. So we'll see in the, how this goes, and you certainly will get uh, that report also once we, we have it. So that will be, as you mentioned, November 7th, uh, the same day as the vote, but that really <coughs> shouldn't really impact because uh, we, won't, we won't be doing much on that. Uh, and when we're ready to give you the results, there, there was a presentation at the SU board on that, but we can also uh, do that with you. I have nothing further really to act on, 40, on Act 46. That was a very thorough presentation. Um, facilities, some questions that I've been asked that, uh, that uh, I have answers for. So one question came up was, uh, it was, an, it was observed at the end of this summer that there was a private contract cutting lawns in the district, and we were asked about that. So when we review our financials on three different occasions, a private contractor um, was hired. You remember at the end of the, year, end of the summer, um, Jerry's crews were pretty overwhelmed with getting the buildings open, so the decision was made to bring someone in to cut the grass and also to sweep the parking lots after the construction was done before the um, um, staff arrived and after construction was done. So yes, there was a private contractor cutting lawns for a brief period at the end of August. Um, there was also a question about on the construction project about what happened to um, salvaged materials, things like copper tin, the old boilers and stuff like that. So my review with, uh, with the contractor about what happened to like the old boilers that were pulled out. They all went into um, dumpsters, recyclable dumpsters, but was the question specifically to us, was there a revenue stream back to us? And no, there wasn't. Um, in fact, the contrary said it was probably of questionable value. The boilers are old um, steel tube, steel tube boilers. Not, it's not a lot of copper, which would be the valuable metal, it's steel and the contractor was responsible, or their subcontractor, contractor, whoever removed it, was responsible for disposing of it. And so much of that was also affected by the asbestos wrapping that it was of dubious value. So the perception that there was a lot of valuable scrap metal pulled out of the buildings, uh, Renee and I have reviewed this in our estimate, uh, no, there wasn't, and there was no specification in the contract that if there was value, that the revenue stream would come back to the district. So it was really the responsibility of the contractor to remove it. So. Thank you. Um, uh, Vic Milani's presentation on safety, follow up on that. The schools um, all have their red and green cards, but they're not numbered yet because are, are they uh, all the numbers in place? We're starting, Molly started. Yeah. So uh, what we had to do first was order all the numbers, and there was a delay on that. I'm seeing that over some doors, good. So uh, when I was first asked, all I could report at that time was the numbers had been ordered, but um, not in place. And again, the staff was uh, pretty overwhelmed um, with getting the school started. And as you know, they all did a spectacular job with that. Um, The punch list, for my estimation, that I was asked about the BSD punch list when we reviewed that. Um, there's very few items left on that, and I know, Jerry, if, if you have an update on where that was from last week, but last week there was... We I, probably have less than half a dozen items yeah, left that's, on the punch list. Yeah, that's what it looked like. Yeah. And the, um, the smoke detectors at Monument are our responsibility. They've been ordered, but... Right. Waiting to be installed. It's just a matter of getting yeah. work in. So we do, we have, do have until January to get that in. Right. It's the way we've done. Long yeah, before, before that. Um, field trips. Um, last, I'm asking for some clarification from the board, some understanding. Um, last month, I almost said last week too, <laughs> you approved. Um, a 75 mile, which is in the, uh, the the policy, allows you to give 75 miles zone that it's an automatic approval. It doesn't have to come to the board. What I want to make clear publicly, <laughs> um, field trip forms still need to come to central office. We're uh, concerned <laughs> that that wasn't happening. And some, because what central office does 
it, this is what a field trip form looks like. We look, they have to list who the chaperones are. We have to check that against our background checklist to make sure the chaperones are vetted and that the right amount of chaperones for the trip, uh, the ratios, to serve, all, all that stuff that, that gets vetted through central office. So just want to be clear that you weren't giving blanket approval that forms don't even have to happen. We still need to generate. Okay, so I promised. Uh, central office staff that I would mention that publicly today. <laughs> um, and the last thing I want to talk about um, is SBAC scores. So I have a, a handout for you on, um, it's a composite sheet of uh, where our grade, our schools went. Let me send a couple of that way. And you'll see, first thing I want to point out to you on the bottom of it, you will see that we're going to give you a full presentation at your November 1st meeting. We received these results last Tuesday. Uh, you already heard that you know, most of our staff that would deal with this was in training on Monday and Tuesday of this week. So the real, you being the first meeting up, we're not ready to give a presentation on that. And in fact, we won't be doing it at Shaftesbury next week either. The first uh, SBAC presentation will be the third week, which will be <laughs> at, uh, for MAU and Powell, and then so we'll be back for you and Shaftesbury at your November meeting with a full presentation on SBAC. What I do have for you, because you know, I think you know, Edie mentioned it earlier today too, in education, we love to talk in acronyms, and if you're not with us, you might be saying, what are you talking about? So I have a two-sided sheet for you. The first side is the assessment schedule for the entire year not just SBAC, but everything from Fast Bridge and TS Gold. And so when you say TS Gold, what are you talking about? Go to the reverse side, and we have a little um, table for your reading um, for what uh, some of these acronyms mean and what grade levels they apply to. What I would like you to do for me, and some of you have already done this, some of you have already sent me emails, for specific questions that you may have that you would like included on that SBAC presentation next month. And I encourage all of you to do the same. Look at these results that with this snapshot of results, which by, by the way is on the bottom you see two things of that first sheet. I gave you the, the date of our presentation. I also gave you the uh, AOE website where all of this is posted. So feel free to go on and look at it and then uh, email me what your questions may be that you would you want our presentation to include other than what we're, uh, we're we're going to do and this is similar to what we've done every year but I realize that there are several new board members here the other thing that um, I, I want to expand on uh, your chair mentioned uh, but October 24th four o'clock Four to six, we're doing a workshop, a budget workshop for board members. It is specifically focused towards new board members, so it's more of a uh, introduction to educational budgeting, but all board members, of course, are welcome. Similar to the workshop that we did for board members when you first came on board back in, we did it back in April of, uh, we did everything from special ed budgeting, but brief, pieces of it. This, this workshop will specifically be on the budget process and how state funding works. And Where and what time? It'll be central office, 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, October 24th, which is a Tuesday. Thank you. All right, and just a reminder, look at what I've given you on SBAC and or any assessment piece and email us and I will see that it is included in the presentation for next week. Thank you very much. Next month. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions for our superintendent? We're moving on. Uh, so, very brief chair's report. The superintendent evaluation committee met uh, for the first time last night. Um, as per the outlined uh, time frame in policy, the committee is behind. Uh, so the committee has adopted an amended time frame that will at least put us in compliance with the superintendent's contract. So as per policy, next meeting, um, we will go into executive session to discuss Jim. And in policy 2600, there is a 
um, and not quite a rubric, but, but points to consider when boards are reviewing their superintendent. So I'd ask you all, uh, prior to next meeting, uh, review policy 2600, please. And then, as I said, at the end of the meeting, we'll go into executive session to gather some thoughts. Um, no action would need to be taken from us, but then I would then take that information and bring it to the superintendent evaluation committee meeting following. So, and that's it for me. Um, to FYI, notice we have the SVSU student enrollments uh, that was emailed out. We also have the budget status report that was rolled out. Any questions about those items? Great. So, um, could I please have a motion for us to enter into executive session so to talk about, let me tell you what we're talking about, because that's, it, Sean, actually, Sean Marie raised an excellent point, that even though the, even though the, the published agenda specifies um, the statute, we, can, we should take that extra step to talk about exactly what that statute specifies. So public meeting law is governed by uh, Chapter 1, VSA 313, and there are only a handful of things that you can legally go into uh, an executive session to talk about. The two things that we are going to talk about in our executive session tonight uh, is the appointment and evaluation of public employees and uh, disciplinary or dismissal action against public employees. And no action will be taken as a result of that executive session, um, so folks can go home if they want. So with that in mind, can I please have a motion, Dr. Kelly, to go into executive session? So moved. Could I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Say aye. aye. Thank you very much. We are in executive session.